focus of this panel is on organizing initiatives from migrants themselves and coalitions with different actors from civil society. The first presentation will be given by Dr. Gabriela Alberti. She's an associate professor at Leeds Business School, Work and Employment Relations. Her main research areas span across the sociology of work and migration, labor and employment relations, social movements and social theory. She's a founding member of the Leeds Migration Research Network. Her presentation is titled Beyond Integration, Migrant Self-Organizing Inside and Outside Traditional Unions. The second presenter is Jose Antonio Moreno Diaz. Jose Antonio is an attorney at law since 1991 and working on migration and asylum and human rights. He is the confederal legal advisor of the Spanish trade union Comisiones Obreras and also a member of different institutions in Spain and the European Union representing the rights of migrants. He was a founder and former president of the Spanish NGO SOS Racismo España. He's going to talk about Elegido 20 years later, lessons from organizing migrant workers in agriculture. The third speaker is Yanira Merino. Yanira was born in El Salvador, immigrated to the US in the 1990s and joined the US labor movement. She worked in numerous union organizing campaigns um, as well as in immigration rights efforts and Central America solidarity work. Since 2000, she has served as national immigration coordinator for the Laborers International Union of North America, and she was the first woman and first immigrant to hold the presidency of the Labor Council for Latin American Advancement. She will talk about the role of immigrant workers on revitalizing the labor movement. So um, I'm very happy to have you all here. Welcome to this panel. And um, I now want to give the floor to Gabriela Alberti. Gabriela, please go ahead and please keep time. You have 15 minutes for your talk. Thank you. Thank you, Martina. And thanks, Glu, for this very, very important event. I'm going to share my screen now. Um, can you see? OK. So my talk today will draw from my research on migrant self-organizing inside and outside traditional unions. And as I go through the research, I will discuss critically the concept of integrating migrants into trade unions. And also some issues about sustainability of organizing. I will focus on two particular case studies, very different from each other. One is the one about the independent workers of Great Britain, which is a small grassroots union and is a case of migrants organizing themselves as a union, so the union led by migrants. The second is the University College Union, where we had an instance of migrants organizing a new committee representing specifically people with um, migrant status. As I said, these are different unions organizing uh, different sectors of the economy. The IWGB is mainly focused on um, organizing migrant workers in the low skilled service sector. Uh, as a small union has actually increased massively in the past few years, has led to some important campaigns, especially in the gig economy. Uh, including employment tribunals uh, for riders and protecting the um, rights of uh, workers who are uh, in the most precarious sections of the economy. The migrant composition is uh, very uh, relevant here with two thirds of migrants, mostly from Latin America and then also black and ethnic minority groups. The University College Union instead is a large union representing academic and academic related workers is a recognized union differently from IWGB. So uh, conduct collective bargaining um, and uh, migrant composition, as you can see from the figures is also interesting, representing really reflecting the, the nature of uh, the academic sector in the UK. Just a little bit of context uh, in terms of migrant work in the UK, um, especially the 
service sectors has been characterized by process of outsourcing flexible strategies where migrants tend to um, fill in the most precarious insecure employment positions and this has been very much illustrated in the case of uh, you know low paid skill uh, low skilled uh, jobs uh, However, process of casualization and precarization are also um, characterizing more and more the so-called highly skilled uh, sectors, including academia, where 34% of staff, uh, according to recent data, are on fixed and contract. Migrants occupy the most uh, precarious position, uh, not only in terms of their contractual status, but also because of the stricter immigration policy regimes that has emerged in the UK since the late 2000s, especially under the so-called hostile environment against immigration, and now uh, enhanced even more with Brexit, where a larger group of migrants are subject to immigration controls. As, as we saw from the beginning of the conference, this uh, very much reduced the possibilities of migrants to organize and raise their voice at work. Considering these vulnerabilities, labor and community organizing have um, uh, collaborated to um, protect the conditions of migrants. Uh, and it's interesting that uh, there have been uh, various degrees of uh, engagement uh, by different unions uh, across uh, sectors, according also to the um, identity and the strategies of different unions as I highlighted by this research. So in terms of my theoretical approach, um, I take issue with what I understand as an integrationist approach to migrant uh, workers organizing. Um, whether through special structures to integrate migrant workers or through equal treatment, as uh, clearly discussed by Pennings and Rusblad in their union dilemma framework, or as part of broader strategy of union revitalization, as argued by Turner and others, my problem with these industrial relations approaches to migration is that migrants continue to be seen as passive recipients of integration strategies. Instead of being considered strategic actor, providing opportunities for union renewal, and we saw with the talk of Ford how important this is, um, Moreover, an integrationist approach includes an institutional focus, whereby even those researchers that have looked at labor community coalitions have actually still focused on the recruitment of migrants for the purpose of strengthening union and, and allowing their survival. So the attention has not been very much on the subjectivities of migrant workers, but rather on questions of organizational survival. And finally, the integrationist approach is problematic because it assumes homogeneity within the existing unions. Whereas, as we argue with my colleague Davide Perot, migrant workers should not be considered as an exceptional figure of labor, but as emblematic of the contemporary diversification of the workforce in its transient and precarious nature. The recent literature on migrant organizing and more broadly on this concept of whole worker model of organizing, such as the one proposed by McAlevey, has been in incredibly important to highlight the importance of grassroots um, models of uh, organizing workers with different characteristics, starting from the bottom up and involving workplace to workplace engagement whereby a strategy to build sustainable, long lasting structures might be counterposed to the approach that we have seen very much within unions that has been mainly uh, aimed at uh, investing only in short term project to invest, to involve migrant workers. With um, my colleague, we've also looked at the tensions between migrants and the established union when process of institutionalization and union self-preservation take over migrants' substantive goals. And this was precisely the case in the um, context of the IWGB union and the Three Cosas campaign. 
A very important campaign led by outsourced migrant workers started in 2012 that actually organized as part of the established union unison, but then decided to leave the union because they didn't feel that their demands were actually really supported. This is um, a group of workers, mainly from Latin America, that have combined a variety of strategies, including community organizing, uh, students' movement support, uh, urban struggles that have really increased massively the visibility of these low paid cleaners, cutters, and um, service workers at the University of London. Critically, one of the reasons why they decided to abandon the established union to join a new branch as part of IWGB was because their leadership positions weren't supported by the main union when the elections uh, uh, for their positions were uh, declared invalid. And you can see from these pictures a variety of strategies of visibility that have been developed by these workers, including the bus for justice that brought the grievance to the heart of the capital in London to claim their equality rights with in-house workers around the issue of sick pay, holiday pay, and pension rights that unfortunately are differently regulated for contractors. Moving on to the case of uh, the UCU Migrant Committee, Interestingly, again, this is a grassroots initiative that has emerged as part of a wider strike in higher education in 2018 against pension cuts, where uh, migrants members actually realized that they didn't have the same right to strike as uh, um, uh, other migrants from the EU and as um, uh, UK nationals, because the regulations around unpaid leave meant that they could have been reported to the employers if they had incurred more than 10 days unauthorized absence. So they realized that they were discriminated in this important issue of the right to strike, and they linked together with the social movement Unis Resist Border Controls to put forward their demands for organizing as migrants and developed a motion to create a committee of migrants at the national level and demand that their migrant status was recognized as a protected characteristic alongside the existing equality structures of UCU. So what did the migrant workers win? In terms of the IWGB, they conducted unofficial strikes that then were um, uh, very useful to trigger process of formal representation. And they actually won important improvements in terms of the sick pay, holiday pay, and access to the contract expansion scheme. Their struggles paved the way for similar victories in other areas of the uh, university, and now the IWGB is actually at the forefront of struggles, not only for these workers in the university services, but also for the gig economy more broadly. The UCU in 2018 obtained a major leg legal victory with uh, finally the UK government changing the national legislation around the, the unpaid leave the strike days would no longer be counted as part of unpaid leave for workers. The, so they were protected finally from the risk of deportation and the right to strike. Recent battles by the migrant committee are particularly relevant in the context of COVID as they successfully lobby the government for the extension of the leave to remain and, sponsor, and sponsorship for all those who cannot travel because of COVID-19 highlighting the importance of mobility struggles as well in this context, context of the health crisis. So let's look more carefully at the factors of success against the barriers in this um, instances of migrant self-organizing inside an established union like UCU and migrants organizing as part of an independent small grassroots union like IWGB. In the case of UCU, migrant members grassroots initiatives were absolutely central to mobilize and involve more members in the union, especially because of the hostile environment that showed how they were actually discriminated against because of their immigration status. 
migrant participation in the strike provided the visibility to show how uh, their contractual and migration status was important in terms of their um, capacity to raise their voice. But what they did was to take in their own hands the bureaucratic rules of the union to actually uh, create a new institution within the union structure. So migrants in a national leadership position managed to um, you know, make a strong argument about the importance of taking into account immigration policy and the, um, and the um, hostile environment. The risk, of course, is one of institutionalization and cooptation for these workers. In the case of uh, IWGB, again, a grassroots mobilizing from below where the question of language empowerment was absolutely central to allow these workers to raise their voice, firstly inside the established union, and then to create their own independent union. The branch became bilingual with extra time allowed for interpreting and translating their issues of these outsourced workers. So showing how this was really a question of migrant voice, not only just a service to be provided to these migrants from Latin America. And also there was an interesting mix of formal and informal bargaining strategies for these um, workers who were, yes, working inside an unofficial union that wasn't directly recognized by the employers, but were triggering uh, attention from the public through um, media um, and the social movement tactics and eventually obtaining important material changes in their conditions vis-a-vis -vis their employer. So moving to the conclusion, it seems that self-organizing of migrant workers emerges where union officers and industrial democracy structures fail to engage or develop into leaders, lay members from migrant groups, or where migrant specific issues are overlooked. As argued by Meardi, um, we need to really move on from organic homogeneous view of solidarity, looking at the diversity of social movement and multiple forms of solidarities as showed in the links with the social movement dimensions in both cases. Ad hoc temporary structures do not work. We need to move to long lasting structures for migrant representation that are able to embed political cultures, migrant specificity, including their visa issues and language issues, not only as service that has to be provided to migrants to better integrate, but as tools for empowerment and organizing. So to conclude, instead of seeing unions organization and sustainability in opposition to migrants substantive goals, as we did probably in our recent work with Davide Perot, we need to actually start to thinking seriously about how creating sustainable organizational structures for migrants contribute to the wider strengthening and sustainability of trade unions for all. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Gabriela, for this insightful and interesting talk. We now go directly to the second presentation by um, Jose Antonio Moreno Diaz. So Jose um, Antonio, the floor is yours. Um, you also have 15 minutes. Please keep time. I will give a sign after 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, muchas gracias. Thank you very much. So I will offer you the point of view of the Workers Union in Spain. And thanks to all the organizers of this event. Thanks for this good seminar you offer and to have this option to interchange ideas and incorporate the migrant aspect in the Workers Union. So some details I want to mention. Spain has always been a country for migration. So from, 90s, from the 90s on, we received a lot of migrants, more than migrate ourselves. So starting, the starting point is 1985. At this moment, we negotiate the um, 
the entrance of our country in the European Union. So there, at this point, we had our first law of migration. And 1989, we developed a workers' union strategic, very specifically focused on the um, city. This is a net all over Spain, where we assist migrant workers. It's for foreign workers. So these cities, as I mentioned, is are a workers' union tool for a new scenario. So we have different workers, workers from outside. Why are they different? Because the work they do is conditioning their legal status. So to maintain their legal status, they need certain work, so they're more vulnerable. And of course, they could... So they needed this specific tool, the CEDIS. So they need to be uh, help and support free of charge for all the workers. And independently, if they have a legal or illegal status, if they are already nationalized or not, so the only idea behind is to assist foreign workers. So specifically working about the work permits, the foreigner has to access to their, their certain federation. So it is related to the industry. So we have a really useful tool. And at the same time, they have uh, an access to the normal, ordinary federation workers' union. So in the year 2000, in El Ejido, we had a really perfect storm. The scenario was the following. We had a really huge impact of workers, segregated workers from the rest of uh, the uh, other inhabitants of uh, the village. They live in very precarious conditions. So they are segregated, they are excluded, and socially um, living in precarious condition. So in the, at this point, we had really an insecure, we had a really insecure moment, momentum, because three people died at this moment for, by foreign people. One, had a for, uh, one of the murder had a mental condition and the other one had problems with working permits. And three of those, they, all these three had really illegal status and the very bad, were in very bad con conditions. So from this point, for instance, the one who murdered uh, the woman, well, he had really a hard psychological co uh, condition and couldn't access to any health care at, uh, in our country. So at this point, it was a point of inflection with which ex were really an excuse from the conservative measure um, to really start to be xenophobic and to attack really the autochthonous workers uh, at, at this region and also uh, the unions and the workers who have been in, uh, helping those foreign workers, for instance, the Red Cross. So generally speaking, 
so in and to incorporate uh, these aspects of a union, of the workers' union, offer really, uh, show really uh, the general problems. There are labor sectors which, which has been ab abandoned by domestic workers because of the bad conditions. For instance, when I talk about Domestic workers. I'm. I'm. To, I'm also including those workers who are from the European uh, Union and who have the illegal status. Those workers, those domestic workers, are really fleeing from this sector. Sector who is really precarious. We call them the the sector with the five P's. It is painful. It is hazardous. It is precarious. It's with a lower income and little considered social socially. So these are sectors that, for instance, are construction and the harvest, the agricultural uh, sector, and the domestic service. In El Ejido, we are talking about harvest, we are talking about the agriculture sector, they have very bad con uh, conditions, very, very low income, and um, the... Um, uh, em employer are not respecting the the working contracts. They have got lower income than legally established, and the accommodations they offer are very very bad. So if we have a look at uh, Almeria, you have to work under plastic, uh, under condition of fifty degrees plus, um, with pesticides, with uh, toxic substances and this is very very hard work hard physical work so of course all workers domestic workers try to avoid as possible this type of work so after the incidents i've mentioned we had really um a hunt uh, against foreign illegal workers, even with uh, the intervention of the police. So there was really a racist, it was really grow, a racist issue. So uh, El Ejido has been originally Um, being really uh, very well uneducated people. First, they have worked in very bad conditions themselves, and then they do the same thing to the other, to the um, foreign workers. So they abuse these uh, of these foreign workers, and they are surprised that these foreign workers act in some manner. So at this moment, I've been there for one month in place to um, help out because all, all what was harvesting um, was stopped. There was a big strike. The seasonal workers stopped working and I tried to, tried to intervene during this time. So not only the harvesting was impossible, and we, from the workers' union, we tried to improve the contracts in place. So the unions were involved in all this process. And we negotiate in the name of the workers with all the companies and the union of the companies, specifically the following points to get good accommodation, to get a, a, a contract, to regularize the working hours, to have a collective agreement. And well, now, 20 years after, we still see the same problems. The workers are still living in bad conditions. 
uh, but the companies still need them. They need the workers to maintain their work, their, um, they need, they still need them for the companies. So, and from this point on, on as they need more and more workers, there are even coming workers, illegal workers, and the per they're with no working permits. So this is really a vicious cycle because this illegal status will never finish. And these illegal workers will always uh, work in an ab abusive condition. So a good practice is the following. We had a general strike at Murcia last year. Murcia has a very similar profile. They have got also um, fruits and the plastic and the general strike has affected all type of procedures in the agriculture sectors. So the workers union and the labor union uh, helped out. They also, of course, wanted to improve the condition of the seasonal workers. So offer them accommodation, organize effectively uh, the, tra uh, the traveling conditions, um, get contracts in the proper language, etc. So we from World Workers Union, we understand that we should avoid uh, the different classes and do, we shouldn't separate foreigners and domestic workers. There's only j just one class, the working class. And we shouldn't distinguish uh, by the passport or by um, the skin color. So the workers unions should be independent and that we should always incorporate the, migra the migration point of aspect and develop a certain social pedag um, um, training. So in our agenda, we have, of course, this aspect, this point of view, incorporated. 10% uh, ten, ten of our workers are workers from the foreign, from foreign co countries. So we are an organization that represents really a huge amount of foreign workers. 2004, we create um, a tripartito, that means where we reunite the government, the employees and the working unions, we get together, we gather together and um, try to assess all type of aspects of migration. So that's what we want to do. We want to support the foreign workers, and adapt, of course, and this is something we are working hardly, also work from the international point of view. We want to incorporate these points in, uh, in the European Union and in, in, the, in the unions of the European Union. And very important for us is to reduce and to eliminate fascism because for us, it's really, uh, dangerous. We as a workers union, we want to be very, very clear and to fight against racism and xenophobia. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jose Antonio, for sharing this important experience with us. So we directly go to the third presentation by Yanira Marino. So, Yanira, the, Yanira, the floor is yours. Please go ahead. 15 minutes. 
There are over 45 million immigrants in the United States, and more than 11 million are undocumented. Before the global pandemic began, immigrants in the U.S. represented an overwhelming majority of workers in low-wage jobs, were subject to, highest, to the highest numbers of workplace fatalities, highest numbers of wage theft, lower levels of pension coverage, and only 38.2% of this segment, segment of the population had access to health coverage. These facts, along with the anti-immigrant and anti-refugee environment that has prevailed in the U.S. from Proposition 187 in 1994 in California, put in the map by a Republican, Pete Wilson, that was seeking to repeal the 14th Amendment, their grants, citizenship to children born to immigrants without legal status, to the 100 uh, policy changes that aim to prevent people to even entering the country, denying legal status to those who apply for it, taking legal status from those who had it, eliminating process protections and how people are treated by the immigration agencies, detaining, deporting, and terrorizing immigrant communities, and retaliating against anyone who spoke against these policies of the Trump era. Has made this, all of this has made life substantially more difficult for all immigrants but also has propelled them into, into the streets to demonstrate, to be more political and civic active. And actually, dividing victory in November owes much to this upsurge of activism among immigrants. Although non-citizens could not vote, they participated in big numbers on phone and text banks, walk prisons, which help ensure the defeat of Donald Trump. So as you can see, immigrant workers are ready to fight and ready to organize. Now, with the union membership hovering at around 7% of the private sector, immigrants, by virtue of their enormous presence in the service, agricultural, and construction sectors, to mention a few, will play a key role in bringing unions share of the workforce back to a healthier levels. The median age of immigrant workers in the United States relative to other populations and the rapid growth as a group made them even more attractive as potential union members. Because of this combination of factors, immigrants are perfectly, perfectly positioned to join unions in large numbers. Unionization will provide this widely exploited population with a louder, louder voice and protections to improve their working condition in any economic standing. Widespread unionization of immigrant workers can reinvigorate the labor movement while pro improving Latino and immigrant economic conditions through better jobs, higher wages, and benefits. For unions to continue to be a source of power and protection for all workers, they must face the reality that an aging workforce and membership are causing their numbers to diminish. As immigrant workers are organizing and mobilizing their communities, they know that the road to social and economic prosper prosperity is mired with hurdles, from wage theft to increased rates of death at the workplace. Immigrant workers are becoming increasingly susceptible to a wide range of attacks on their labor, human, and civil rights. And while many advances have been made in the past decade, more work and advocacy needs to be made in order for immigrants to achieve parity. 
Although the current outlook for immigrants is uncertain, their potential for growth is impressive, making huge gain in the workforce. It is not only a surprise that the future for immigrants can be drastically different and positive, but in order, in order to realize this potential, immigrants must harness their strength and exert their voice in the workplace. Joining a union will be an essential step for immigrant workers and their families. Through union representation, immigrants can achieve higher wages that will help them fight poverty and gain access to health and retirement benefits. As union members, they will have a stronger voice to advocate, organize, and hold institutions and elected officials accountable. Despite the vital role unions play in protecting workers, the share of workers represented by, represented by a union is in decline by the numerous pieces of legislation they have weakened union and existing, existing collective bargaining agreement. It is clear that organized labor must make a strategic investment in their outreach to immigrants and all other, all other minorities. The potential for growth in organizing immigrants and Latinos is critical lifeline that labor union must use in order to stay relevant. More importantly, labor unions can use this new membership to leverage a more pro-worker agenda and reverse the laws they have weakened collective bargaining for working people. But the labor movement must develop a community-based strategy linked to labor issues, targeting bilingual organizing campaigns to ensure immigrants understand not only the right to organize, but the civic, gender, political, and human rights, so they can fully benefit and participate. More importantly, the labor movement will need to embrace this new workforce by creating pathways to leadership in the work side and in the union. Let me repeat that is important in the union. All of these factors truly highlight why unions and immigrants need each other now more than ever. This mutually beneficial partnership will not only save the American labor movement and improve the lives of Latino and immigrant working families, but would also reinforce the national economy security and contribute to a better future for generations to come. I want to say thank you for the opportunity to speak here. And I want to leave you, I want to share with you uh, the statement of President Richard Tronka, president of the AFL-CIO. Let me see if I can do this, uh, about immigration, which is important when a national leader recognizes this. Many challenges are faced by the immigrant community, but also many challenges are being faced by the labor movement at this point in the United States. And this partnership actually really gonna work for both. And that's how we see it. I'm an immigrant myself, as um, when I was introduced mentioned, but I also know the difference that when you become a union member in this country. So, and this is Richard uh, Tronka, President Richard Tronka speaking about. So thank you very much for the opportunity. I look forward to your questions. So thank you very much, Yanira, for another very interesting uh, presentation. And a big thanks again to the three of you for sharing this, this rich experience, um, uh, which shows also the diversity of problems, of challenges, of reactions, of organizing um, initiatives, and so on. So we, we still have a little time for um, um, the questions. And I would uh, start with uh, the questions which have been posed um, um, to Gabriela. 
And um, I suggest that Gabriela answers before I then go to um, the questions to Jose Antonio and to uh, Yanira, okay? So um, the first question, Gabriela, was uh, from ASAC2 um, about, um, um, well, you mentioned that there are several groups of migrant workers who are been, being treated differently. So why? Why are they being differently? I would also um, like to, um, to add um, uh, two more questions um, um, at once so you can answer um, uh, the several questions in your first answer. So the second question comes from Arturo Ruiz. Um, um, he wants to know if the UCU migrant committees are recognized by the labor legislation. And then there's a question by Nicola Fernandez Bravo. Um, he says you mentioned a critical approach to the integrationist approach, but you did not elaborate on alternative paradigms, probably due to time limitations. Can you mention what, what would be such a paradigm? So maybe you can answer these three questions now. I have two more for you. Excellent questions. Thank you very much uh, to all the participants. Um, so in terms of the differences between migrant groups, I guess you were referring to the, the case of UCU in particular. So the context of the emergence of that migrant committee was uh, during 2018. At that time, um, there was a major uh, legal status difference between European Union nationals and non-European Union nationals in the sense that only uh, the second group was subject to immigration controls because at that time there was still free movement of labor uh, to the UK as part of the European Union. So that particular piece of legislation that said, if you go beyond 10 consecutive days of uh, uh, you know, unauthorized, unpaid leave, then you can be reported to the Home Office. It only applied to people on visa, to people from outside the EU. So this is a very clear example where um, immigration policy matters directly for the workplace. So this is just for the first question. Um, uh, UCU, um, differently from IWGB, is a recognized union that conducts every year collective bargaining with the employer on uh, basic terms and conditions like pay, um, pensions, etc. The migrant committee doesn't have in itself a bargaining power. That is, there is not such a thing as like migration specific uh, uh, bargaining. You know, which, which, you know, it's an interesting idea. Like there is this idea of equality bargaining and maybe migration comes under it, but it's still conducted by the union as a whole. So I think your question is interesting because it makes us think like, for example, why migration wasn't specifically included in the four fight uh, campaign by UCU, which was you know, part of the uh, recent strike, which focused on gender, for example, and, and um, ethnicity, but not on migration. So good question there. Um, and then um, the final question is about paradigms and, and, and way forwards. So, you know, I think in a moment of uh, uh, increasing nationalism, xenophobia, increasing violence against um, uh, people of color, um, we, we need to be careful at saying like, we are against integration. Uh, my uh, polemic with the integrationist approach of trade unions is especially related to considering migrants as passive recipients. Uh, rather than uh, leaders of change. And when I was thinking, can we say that one model is better than the other? So what is the way forward? You know, migrant self-organizing like a separate union or inside established union. Um, is, there, is there a better model? I don't think there is. I, didn't, I think we need to look at this example as historically specific in, in context of uh, cultures and socioeconomic situation, but also um, 
I was thinking in terms of terms and, and if we can think more in terms of empowerment, perhaps, rather than integration uh, in, in, uh, in terms of, like, you know, identifying like keywords, this, this might be helpful. But I don't think that, uh, I, I definitely don't think that trade unions should give up the idea of including migrant workers. It's just the, the term integration it brings with it a lot of uh, nationalist assumption about homogeneous universal working classes that I don't think is um, uh, so straightforward anymore. Thanks. Thank you very much, Gabriela, for clarifying. So I have uh, still two more questions for you. So the first comes from um, Sonia Grit, and she uh, says, Gabriela, in your research, you compared two different sectors whose workforce have very different characteristics. Did your research allow for identifying sectoral specificities or comparisons? To what extent was the sector a relevant aspect to interpreting the findings in relation to migrant organizing, integration, et cetera? And she says, I'm particularly interested in migrant worker organizing in the ed education sector. And the last question comes from Malika Ashur. She asks if we can say that experiences uh, show that traditional unions failed in their approaches to migrant workers, and it's time to think out of the box and support new approaches for organizing migrant self-organizing worldwide or if it's better to push unions to adopt new approaches towards migrant workers? Again, excellent questions. Thanks so much. Um, the question of sector is incredibly mm -hmm. relevant. Uh, and I believe that uh, wherever we study migrant labor, we have to be a, a specific sensitivity towards um, what kind of work they actually do. Because the kind of work you do will uh, strongly influence the kind of uh, um, mobilization potential. Um, and definitely, if I have to compare the, the low paid uh, skilled workers and, uh, you know, 10 pounds an hour kind of pay in London and the uh, academics in, in Leeds that they talk to, um, definitely, even, even if both of them might have different uh, experience of precarity, they're both on fixed up fixed term contracts, um, the sector where they work will make a massive difference in terms of the actual material conditions, but also perhaps in terms of occupational identity. And I haven't um, thematized this aspect in my presentation. I think doing comparative research, let alone across country, even just between case studies in, a, in the same country is extremely difficult because you have to consider all this element. But I believe that right now, despite the sectoral difference, it's quite stunning to see how this process of casualization, precarization often creates the same subjective problems. So um, not enough uh, pay because, you know, zero hours contracts. So you, you need to collect more pay or um, difficulty in identifying who your real employer is. These are things that we can see across sectors. So the commonality is, is also very important, but I agree with you that sector specificity is important. And then, yeah, like thinking outside the box, absolutely. Um, I think right now um, it's even more difficult because um, trade unions are gonna be in a kind of defensive position uh, with the economic effect of the pandemic, uh, the uh, appalling, uh, embarrassing uh, offer of uh, pay increase, like just yesterday, only 1% was offered to care workers in the UK, like who have been carrying, you know, the, the burden of, of uh, the pandemic. It's just outrageous. So I think that it will be you know, the more it's difficult to, to think about the boxes now that we are more in a defensive position, the, the more we need to push for it. Because if we want to restart in, in a stronger way with in terms of labor organizing, we need to be more creative. And the Latin American workers experience is excellent. I can't forget um, participating in the language swap. So rather the language classes, there were language swap between Spanish and English organized. 
uh, by the Latin American Workers Association that was actually drawing from uh, indigenous uh, popular education strategies to not only teach migrants English, but also for the English people to teach Spanish and create new forms of solidarity also through these cultural exchanges. Definitely think outside the boxes. Thank you so much, um, Gabriela, for your clear answers and for your thoughts on that. So um, I would now like to um, go to the questions for um, Jose Antonio. Um, so the first one comes from, um, from Rob Rees. Um, he wants to know to what extent does um, the specific cultural and political context the, migrant, the migrants bring have an impact? So he says, I think Milkman suggests something about the more politicized and collective cultures brought by migrants to US from Latin America compared to white workers. So that is the first question. I will also um, uh, read the second to you. Um, there are then another two, but um, the second question comes from Maria Mendes. And she asks, can you inform us how migrants are organized in the Comisiones Obreras? Are there particular migrant structures? To my knowledge, migrant women workers in the agricultural sector in South Spain have their own particular problem. How does your trade union work take this into account? So maybe you just answer these uh, first uh, questions, to these first two questions, please. Muchas gracias. Um, dos cuestiones. Una. Eh, respecto al, al, al debate general sobre la, la incorporación de la agenda migratoria a la agenda sindical. So, concerning in this question in the comisiones obreras, the worker, un, work and unions, we assumed it from the from the first point. So we do, didn't think about the integration of the foreign um, for of the foreign workers, we have a proactive term, which is like incorporate. So it's a very general term. So we didn't need even to debate that the foreign workers, for me personally, even speaking, it's a, it's really an international question. It's international workers. We don't have a nation. The workers have just a sure name. And his, the show name maybe is foreign worker. So this makes him more vulnerable and he needs more or she needs more protection. So this is obviously a, nece um, a necessity that we see at workers union. Capitalism has always used and abused of a globalization and a lot of elements has been benefiting the uh, c capitalism. So the workers fight could be also very useful because it has been a vertical fight, but not incorporating the migrants into the workers union could create a vertical conflict between the classes and also a horizontal conflict inside of the class. So there's a tension between class and ca capital and also between this same social class. And this is really a problem for the work union and also for the workers. So we from Comisiones Obreras didn't have this debate. And it hasn't been a bad idea, I think. So considering women, women have a general factor because they are more vulnerable in general. So it will be soon the day of the workers uh, with women of the workers' women, because there's still an uh, income gap. So the women workers, foreign women workers, are more precarious as well. So uh, when they harvest uh, the strawberries and red, ber red berries, for instance, we had problem of gender and uh, violence against women not because they are foreign workers, more because they are women. So we have to be very precarious about that, precious about that. It's not only the aspect of being a foreign worker. 
Because these are women that are only working just for a season. So they can not really get into, uh, well, in our workers' union, they are not really assessed by us because they are just only for a short time in the country. And there's also the cultural context. The workers' union has tried to be pedagogic about that. So we are aware of the different cultural backgrounds. And well, labor unions are different in foreign countries and the idea and the concept about labor unions are different. So the tools we have here are very different and we have to show that our unions could help and we do that through facts. Nothing is for free. And we have to show that the unions are useful. And we do that by incorporating the work foreign workers into our agenda. So especially in those sectors where a lot of foreign workers are um, unassessed. This means in construction area, agricultural area, and we have to be useful. And this is the only manner we can achieve something. Thank you very much for your clarifying answers, uh, Jose Antonio. I have um, two more to you, and both uh, questions refer to um, um, international cooperation of uh, Comisiones Obreras. Um, the questions come from Arturo Ruiz, and he wants to know if there's any initiative like the ETUC or um, Comisiones Obreras um, um, RSMMS for Latin America. And um, he posed another question into the, the chat regarding, um, well, first, uh, first of all, saying that um, Comisiones Obreras does a very good job in Spain. Um, and wants to know what solidarity does um, Comisiones Obreras pro provide to other trade union organizations in other countries? Um, we've seen that you already answered that in the chat, Jose Antonio, you, you wrote, we have um, several inter-union cooperation projects within the framework of the European Trade Union Confederation, but maybe you want to elaborate a little further now. Thanks a lot, Martina. We, as a federation of, of workers' union, we are, of course, integrated in a super regional um, organization in the European Union. And uh, concerning the migration aspect, we have got a very good practice and we collaborate with all Latin American countries. And five or six years ago, in the year 2015, we had, we developed together with the Italian co colleagues, uh, um, a union of the sub-Saharan workers. So we will try to have a multilateral focus, not only considering the um, the ori original countries, the transient countries and the target countries. And this migration movement, um, well, there we have to be and have to be active. And it would be very effective if we incorporate this different perspective of these countries. That means the original countries and the transitional countries. And that's something what we are doing right now. Um, in the, at this project, we are collaborating with a lot of African countries and especially the countries from the north of Africa, Mar Maroc, Argelia and T Tunisia and Portugal, France, Italy. Italy. This is a, a project we um, gathered twice a year and we position ourselves concerning of the international pact concerning safety, which was approved 2018 in Marrakesh. 
and also the pact uh, that was presented from the European Commission, and it's still um, well under debate under Portuguese presidency. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jose Antonio. Um, before I now go to the questions to um, Yanira, I just wanted to announce that there is um, uh, still a question um, um, to the whole panel. I will pose after um, Yanira has responded uh, the questions which are specific to you, okay? So I um, start with the first two questions. It is three questions to you, Yanira, and the first one is, is there any initiative to establish a solidarity work network in countries of origin, transit, and destination among trade unions? So this is the first one. And the second one is, what is the specific weight of race and ethnicity in the unionizing experience? Do you consider it meaningful? And how can it be probably, properly measured? So these are the first two um, uh, questions to you, please. Thank you for the questions. To the, to the efforts of solidarity work, I mean, most unions have connection with the solidarity center within the AFL-CIO. And even the Change to Win Federation have their own work. So there's always an attempt to establish the connection with uh, unions, uh, from union to union, in other countries, but specifically I work with ascending countries, I think comes more from the perspective of um, the work that we do with the community. So we, it's done with the communities. In the case of my union, I come from the construction sector, for example, we establish direct connections with workers in, the, in, the, in Mexico uh, and kind of learn and support their work, not only through our international um, body that we represent, but from city to city, from worker to worker. And that have been able to provide some sort of support, not only from US workers uh, to Mexican workers, but the other way and the issue of immigration, for example. When there was a, a specific call in Mexico to the US government, with the issue of immigrants, and that is the solidarity work. I guess that the, 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 the more solidarity work that we see have been the work of unions do with worker centers in the United States. They have established, once again, my union, for example, have worked very hard. My union and the organization that I represent, Labor Council for Latin American Advancement, have worked very hard with uh, worker centers to open worker centers, in this case, in the country of El Salvador. So trying to bring together different ways of organizing, but knowing, connecting worker to workers, knowing the reality. Um, something that I think before this war happened in the United States, we were only seeing migration within the borders of the United States. What do I mean by that? We were not seeing the root causes why people were leaving their countries. And I think that is important. Uh, that is important to share. It's important for U.S. born workers to understand why immigrants come to this country, why it's the reason they push them out of the country. Uh, and, and so that elaborates a little bit of the solidarity work that we do. Can we do more? Yes. Is that a, ch a challenge? Yes. Can we look in for the different ways to do it? Definitely. And that is the work that I basically uh, my organization is doing. But it's also true for all the unions independently outside the Federation. Uh, in the United States, the second question, the United States for many, many years, the, the, the question of race have always been between black and white. That's a reality. So the integration of uh, a new workforce uh, that from different background presents its challenges. I think we all agree that in, in, from, from the point of view of the fights that we do every day in the, here, either confronting police, or organizing of or confronting um, harassment uh, in the job. Actually, once you're a worker, uh, we often say it doesn't discriminate, but is is a 
is a little bit, it, it's a lot more when you, when you don't have any status or a gender issue in this country. So does it wait? Yes, it does. But given there have been an effort of black and brown efforts to actually bring issues, um, labor issues together uh, in moving them forward, I think the process of education, the process of learning the laws in this country, the course, process of how to understand uh, the union's uh, institutions have probably put a little bit of disadvantage to immigrant workers, not only Latino immigrant workers, but immigrant work, workers from all over. Um, and um, how to measure that, I, it's, it's very difficult. I think we, if we use the measurements of organizing of how do we grow. So I, I would say that in, at least within Latin American immigrants, um, raising decisions, bringing decisions up uh, more uh, into union uh, arena, but also outside has been very helpful to see it. How did that develop and the dynamics of that? Let's not forget there is a large number of Latino US born in this country. They have made the issue of immigration a very important issue for them. They have made the issue of language a very important issue with them because first generation Latinos in this country uh, want to still talk to their abuelitas in, in Spanish or whatever language they can. So that, that, is, that is very important. So I don't know that can be a measure where we push um, through that Latino electorate issues that are important that applies to race. The issue that sometimes comes, and we, I cannot not touch that, it is uh, as Latinos, we have people that come from different backgrounds race-wise, no? So sometimes brothers that are African descending Latinos will not find the same representation and the same voice that other uh, white Latinos, for example, will have. And, and that, is a, that is a challenge, but that's also a challenge for women. Um, um, and in the US, women, Latino women are making four uh, 54 cents to a dollar made by a white male in the workforce. This put a disadvantage, clear disadvantage women to uh, women. And if we go and add the aspect of undocument or documents, it is even more. So all of these factors, we see it. I don't know if it's a concrete measurement, but we see it how and we develop ways to push to advance them. And not certainly uh, from a perspective of race sometimes, but from a perspective of ethnicity, uh, gender, and, la and language uh, uh, access. Thank you so much, Yan uh, Hira, for um, your important um, answers to, for your answers to this important question. And I have a third question to you um, um, regarding the US case. So the question is, could you find a difference in the mobilization between migrant workers in America after the election? Did they realize the, um, the role that they played taking Trump out of power? I, I say yes. And in my presentation, I said that although immigrants don't, do not vote in this country, it was clear that mm -hmm. our participation uh, on doing civic work from uh, beginning uh, in the US, we say the three pawns, no, Be begin fighting for legalization, then US citizenship uh, registered to vote, and then getting out to the polls. And I think it was clear, uh, I think data showed that the increase of Latino voters uh, were amazing. And the increase on that voter block for Latinos came from younger voters. And the younger voters, you have to see that immigrants, they have been here for a long time, more than 20 years. Their children are turning the age of 18. I believe that the numbers show us that there is a first, um, first Latino, uh, I think Latinos turning the age of 18 every 18, 18 seconds. And these Latinos are the sons and daughters 
most likely of immigrant workers and even undocumented parents. So that uh, they, this year is where we see the combination of them being able to vote. So that, that's the first group. And the second group were you, uh, immigrants that had already been legal status and now have become US citizens. So that's what we say. So my, my answer to that question is yes, we saw it not only in how we participated in the civic life, whether or not we had any status in this country, but also in enlarging the universe of voters uh, that actually play a key role on, on winning the White House for the Biden administration. Thank you very much, Yanira, for your insightful answers. And um, as I already said, we now have also uh, questions to the panel in general. Meanwhile, we have four and we have 10 minutes left. So um, um, please try to be brief in your answers and maybe select the answer you um, might be answering to. So I start with two questions which come from Kelly Simemba. Um, his question is, El Ejido in Spain, where xenophobic riots targeted migrant workers 20 years ago. All the presenters are giving examples of Europe, the Middle East and North Africa, Nigeria and Ghana. But are there any examples of these projects in Eastern and the Southern parts of Africa? Remember the xenophobic attack in South Africa 2018 and 19. And just to mention also the comment of Sim Simone, this question was also asked yesterday from the, um, from the same person, but not taken up. Maybe I think especially um, Jose Antonio, you could um, answer to this question. And Kelly Sim Simemba also posed a second one, um, saying in the presentation by all the panelists, I can identify that migrant works worldwide are going through similar challenges. Is there an African model? So maybe we just start with that and uh, maybe Jose Antonio, you could uh, give a brief answer to that. Concerning the successes of El Ejido, we did not protest against xenophobia. I think that the experience in our countries has shown that there are protests, um, xenophonic programs, not only within the the unions, but also within the population against foreigners, not only foreign workers, but against foreigners. I think that's an important factor. At that time in Spain, um, there was no political speeches. Um, the fascist um, parties um, have been an exception in Spain. We did not have a political representation of the uh, <laughs> right-wing parties, but they have um, a representation in the parliament. So Spain is also quite a normal um, country, so to say, for the right-wing parties. Right-wing parties have a false debate about identity, a false debate about immigration and the abuse of public services and social services, etc. So we have to be really militant in counteracting the fake news of the extreme right wing against the um, foreign population. Because um, the fascists at the moment are contaminating and intoxicating the uh, living together in the population and they are being very militant. Evidently, we, of course, have a long history of working with the um, Moroccan and African population because the Moroccan had been the first immigrants to um, come to Spain. There are only 14 kilometers between, in Gibraltar between Spain and um, uh, Morocco. And therefore, many people have come to work in the agricultural sector. That was uh, idea for them and therefore there we have seen uh, lots of Africans and Moroccans working in Spain and um, the Latin American 
the community has been also um, an administrator for them because they speak Spanish and also they have very similar culture and they have the same language and the same way of life. We are sort of um, brotherhood countries together. This is a factor which is def definitely facilitating incorporations. But we have also seen migration flows from other African um, countries like as the Senegal, for example, and also from Eastern Europe. We have a large um, community of almost 600,000 people from Romania who are living in Spain now. And um, the Roman language is very similar to Spanish and due to the growth of co the construction sector in Spain, many people have come from Romania to work there. So we have different models concerning unions, for example, the union movement, for example, is quite normal, so to say. We have collective bargaining negotiations, for example, where we have elements that um, definitely look at the migration aspects. For example, if one family member dies, for example, that happens every the second day, for example, but um, if then people have to go back, for example, the people have four days to go back to their countries of origins, to the um, burial of their family members, for example, that's definitely a differentiating factor, but it makes it uh, more difficult for being a foreigner, not only a foreign worker, but for being a foreigner. So um, the unions treat them the same way whether they are simply um, whether they are simply foreigners or foreign workers, we do not do trade union um, differentiation by trade unions for um, trade unions or for the, the way of work that they are doing. These are given schemes that we have already, not only in the work sectors or the workplace that we have, the arguments, um, for example, like right-wing parties, for example, say also concerning ser public services or health services or also social living spaces, for example. This is where we, the r extreme right-wing comes in to um, foment um, their prejudices, but not only concerning labor, but concerning the general well-being. Thank you very much, uh, Jose Antonio. If uh, Gabriela and Janira don't want to add on that, I would go to the next two questions. Yeah. Um, so um, um, I um, take two questions together, which are a bit similar. Um, so there is a question by Justina Yambo from Namibia. Um, my question goes to all the panelists. What do you suggest? that workers' unions do to protect illegal immigrant workers. And she means workers from Angola moving into Namibia, for example. And there's a similar question from uh, Michael Kandukutu. Um, how have you dealt with statelessness in the United States of America, especially given the pending vaccination programs that are currently underway? Um, <clears throat> Um, I think, Yanira, um, you could um, probably answer this last question. And I don't know if uh, Gabriela or Jose um, Antonio also want to. So first, Yanira, and then Gabriela, OK? Yanira, please. Um, from the perspective of, um, you know, you incorporate that fight, I think Jose Antonio was saying, into the fight for uh, as part of the fight for workers. No, you want that it, there, there's no difference uh, when everybody in this country have to re receive the vaccine. And that has been the demands of unions, as also has been the demands of immig the, the immigrant communities in this country. So it's, an, it's a strong, united voice. Be sure and be vigilant that whatever laws that are being passed in order to, as a response to this pandemic, uh, there is no difference um, when it comes to the health uh, that uh, comes to the uh, immigrant community as it is to the US born community. That doesn't mean that we haven't faced our, our issues. 
uh, there have been extreme strong calls uh, from, especially from the Republican Party, trying to let, leave uh, immigrants out, especially those who they are undocumented. So the best response that we have had it is moving forward agendas that are inclusive of everybody. And I think our slogan has been nobody is safe. If um, somebody is left out, trying to say that these communities, whoever we leave out would also is, is at risk of anybody. We work shoulder to shoulder every day. And so if anybody is left out, we, we all pay the price. Um, it, hasn't made, it hasn't been easy given that the right has a very strong voice, especially right now in what they have used uh, in many occasions, it is the issue of it, the status of immigrants. And not only the status, because that attack has also been against uh, legal uh, or documented, documented immigrants in this country. And so moving, uh, once again, moving a solid united message along with pushing policies that will be inclusive of immigrants, inclusive when we say old workers, doesn't matter where you come from, what language you speak or what status you have is what I think is a positive way in, in the US we have been doing that a lot, not only with the unions, with the immigrant communities, but also in this case with a lot of the worker centers that represent a lot of those immigrant workers. Thank you, Yanira. And before um, giving over to Gabriela, I just wanted to mention um, a comment from uh, comrade Eustace James. Um, he points to the problematic of using the word illegal and says that it would better be referred to as irregular. I fully agree with him. But so, um, Gabriela, um, and please, a very brief answer as we are running out of time. And, um, Yes, there is a, um, a last question afterwards. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, to be brief, in terms of principles, at least in Europe, uh, we could say that unions agree that no one is illegal. Um, but in terms of uh, actual practical support, uh, um, I think there are different levels of action across different European countries. We have seen uh, direct uh, support with the process of regularization in the southern European countries, but not very much uh, active support, for example, uh, in the country where I live now in the UK for undocumented migrants. And I do believe this is a, a very important uh, question to address because what we are going to see in the near future is probably more restrictions to mobility for a variety of economic uh, health and other reasons, and therefore more informalization and more uh, undocumented migrants. So unions need to step up their games right now uh, as soon as possible on this very important issue. So thank you, Justina, for uh, raising this very important question. Thanks for your answer. And I think um, this a question uh, points to the fact that um, we have so many layers of social inequalities in between the group of migrants. And this is very important to address um, from all kind of organ uh, organization um, who is organizing migrant workers or they themselves. I have a last question, which, which is not really a question. I just read it to you. It's from Pragya Kana. There are a lot of instances of self-organizing across the globe. How do unions deal with this? Are there any models which are being explored to provide resources around strengthening these? For example, strike schools, et cetera. I think this is a, um, a question which is a bit too global now to really answer. This is, um, I think, a question the whole panel has been about. And I think you have already given a lot of um, examples and ideas on that. But maybe we have a last round and maybe you just formulate one idea which you think would be important uh, to answer this question. So the three of you, please, who would like to start? Um, I, I think it's, uh, it's um, 
when it comes to self-organizing workers, is I think the responsibility of, of unions to kind of see and figure out how we we position ourselves, and I say we unions, in order to recognize uh, the efforts of this community. So um, applying solidarity, uh, I think, in this aspect with the migrants that are in the country, uh, but also understanding uh, how we as a union also, and as nations, benefit of the efforts and that self-organizing and raising the floor for all workers. Thank you. Gabriela, would you like to continue? Hi, yes. Um, I think as a general thing, I'm just thinking about reclaiming time for talking and strategizing with our co-workers. This is something that we have all been come so much under pressure with the uh, increasing in intrusivity of uh, uh, work in all areas of our lives. And, and I think including for people who cannot afford, you know, the, the luxury of having time for organizing, we really need unions to, uh, you know, intervene more in the question of social protections, uh, welfare benefits. We need all migrants to be able to access universal welfare, otherwise they will they will be forced to work many hours every day and have less uh, space and time for sociability. Sociality is such an important element of organizing. So this might be banal, but reclaiming time for organizing and for struggling. Thank you so much, Gabriela. And so um, the last word is yours, Jose Antonio, now. Thank you so much, Martina. I have two ideas to that. The first idea, the irregularity in the situation of um, people without documents, that's a big problem all across the world. Only for um, the employers. We have to know um, as unions if we have irregular workers and there are also companies and um, employers that are illegal and they work in the informal sector also for companies that are irregular, illegal. And illegality, for example, prejudices regular work. And also for the working class in general, that means a problem because then you will have exploiting working conditions and abusive working conditions that will definitely also put a challenge on all workers. So the unions have to work against irregularity or illegal working, be it from employers or employees side. Um, irrespective of um, the country where you're working and from 2000 onwards in Spain, we have tried to tackle this problem for those people who are working permanently. Um, concerning also the social and familiar routing and concerning the second question, equality for everyone and um, equality for living together. We need um, to protect the fundamental human rights, um, the right to health, to um, health services, to education, and for the respect of basic human rights, because all we human beings have the right to, for protection of human rights and to live together. So for all societies, this is very important. And we have to make a social contribution and a cultural contribution to make sure that the culture is also respected, that culture is also enriching um, the domestic culture. Thank you. Thank you so much.